Here's the thing, and some people aren't ready to accept this yet, and that's understandable, but we don't really have time to live in denial anymore of the fact that what we're living through is no longer politics, it's no longer a discussion, it is a war. It is a war for the future of our country, and if you don't understand that, maybe you just think politics is a fun little hobby or something, I'm not really sure what to tell you. This is never going to end peacefully with everyone shaking hands and coming together under one flag. It's just simply not going to happen because in order for that to happen, one side would have to completely compromise its entire worldview. And it's not going to be us. It's not going to be them. They never intended for anything less than complete domination to occur. And I know that might be hard to hear because we tend to get nostalgic about the good old days when we were all Americans, one nation under God. But those days are gone and they're not coming back. I mean, these people don't want you in their country. They want you exiled from mainstream society. They want your constitution shredded. They want your history erased, your heroes gone, your family gone. Everything that you love and cherish about your life is going to change unless, unless you take action. And I have to clarify, I'm not talking about violence, I'm talking about political action, I disavow violence, but there is good news, believe it or not, because there are still, for the time being, millions of strong, intelligent, good men in this country, and it is that breed of men who built this country, and if ever there were a breed of men who could take it back, it would be them. So the point of this is to go over things that you're probably doing that are making you weaker, and then we'll go over some of the things that you can do to make yourself stronger, and we need you to be as strong as possible both mentally and physically, because that's gonna optimize your capacity to be effective, and we don't have time anymore for anything less than 100%, so do stay tuned. John Doyle in Heck Off, Kami. Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Heck Off, Kami. You know what? I think I have a few more things that I'd like to say before we get into the list, so bear with me. Also, go follow me on Twitter. About to break 10,000. That's pretty epic. But another thing that's important to note is remember how in every socialist country, the political opposition was put into camps or murdered or both? Like, we would be foolish to assume that the end results of our little socialist experiment would be any different. So the time to speak up is now, ideally, like 60 years ago, but now it works too, because at least you're only risking losing your job and getting doxxed. But it could get worse in the future, so act now. And I have a video outlining some general ideas for how you can act, but they're by no means perfect, they're just general ideas. But I do have to address the women in the audience, all 7% of them, because I'm primarily going to be talking to the boys here. And the reason for that is that it's primarily their job. I think we all understand that. I think we all understand that men have a much larger propensity towards power and politics. Politics. And that doesn't mean women can't get involved too. It just means that the vast majority of the work is going to be done by men because that's how we're wired. It's just in our nature. And I use the word power there. I did that intentionally. And a lot of conservatives are afraid of the word power. It's a scary word because it implies coercion. It implies that someone is forcing you to do something. Conservatives don't like that. We just want to be left alone. And that's understandable. We'll talk more about that in a second. But all politics really is is just the science of power. That doesn't necessarily mean like some totalitarian dictatorship. It just means anything that has influence and the capacity to execute action, basically. And conservatives are afraid of the word power. We're afraid of it because we don't understand it. We think that if power exists, it's going to be used against us. And so the best strategy is to just minimize power so that it can't be used against us. But the problem with that is that our enemies aren't so nice. And so our choices are basically to fight fire with fire and maybe win. And I say maybe because we've lost about 70 years of ground while we were busy thinking that we could all play nice. Or we could just totally let them crush us and then it's over. I don't like that. It's not a good option. I think we can all agree on that, that we can't allow that to happen. Uh, and by the way, to understand power isn't to want to like sh use the state to shoot people who disagree with you. It just means that you play for keeps. You know that you're correct and you know that the ideas of your opposition are harmful to society and in some cases completely evil. And as a moral person with a vested interest in society and as someone who recognizes that your opposition will crush you if given the chance, you know that you have to act. And the way to act is through force. And I don't mean physical force, I mean like political force. The problem conservatives have is that we don't think force, which really just translates to effort, is necessary. But the reality of power is that it's not exactly pretty. It's a definitive characteristic. Like you kind of have to get your hands dirty sometimes. And that doesn't mean that you have to do things that are immoral. But right now, we basically operate under the Sir Galahad theory of politics, which is, I will win because my heart is pure. Or we talk about the marketplace of ideas, where the best ideas will prevail through competition. This type of thinking is flawed because that's not how politics works. That's not how ideas or information work. Being correct is simply not enough. Having the best ideas simply is not enough. I mean, take a look at the actual market for a perfect example of this. If you look at the most popular smartphone on a global scale for the last however many years, it's always an iPhone. And it's going to continue to be an iPhone for a very long time. This is despite the fact that iPhones, from a technological perspective, aren't even the best phones on the market. Samsung, even LG, they produce smartphones that are better and less expensive than iPhones for a very long time. And Apple has even had to play catch up uh, on some of the innovation from those companies. But it doesn't matter because Apple will remain king because the most important thing Apple has isn't their products or their history. It's their branding, which has given them power. Apple has power. And because of that, they don't even have to have the best product. 
This is why liberal economic theory is so cringe to me. Like you just default to this, hmm, well, people will always pursue the best product at the lowest price. And it's like, yeah, if you assume people are smart, rational beings, but they're not. People respond to power and branding and influence. And that's why Apple wins. And that's also why conservatives lose. But being a man isn't about losing. Being a man is about power. It's about using your drive to do what is necessary. The problem is that if that's not grounded in anything, you're just going to be self-destructive and basically aimless. So you have to be calculating and realistic enough to understand that there are things greater than you to which you should submit, namely Jesus Christ, but also your family and your country, etc. Because if you're only serving yourself, you will be incapable of doing good because human beings are deeply flawed. And we all agree that evil is evil. Like, it's not good. It's not the move, which is why we really should realize that at this point, the left versus right dichotomy is just an obfuscation of really what we're dealing with, which is the age-old conflict between good and evil. And if you want to win that war, which is what it is, you have to prepare for it. And one of the ways you can do that, and this is something you won't hear from any other commentator, by the way, uh, is by reading military theory. Everyone immediately thinks Sun Tzu. I would argue that Karl von Clausewitz is better. He was a Prussian general. And these are the kinds of book recommendations that you'll get on the website, by the way, when you get a membership. Some food for thought, but uh, von Klauswitz said that the conqueror is always a lover of peace. He would prefer to take over our country unopposed. And that's why this idea of like, oh, well, you know, they're just crazy. We don't have to fight back. They'll figure it out when they get older. Everyone's ideas are equal because who really even knows what's correct? You know, this like liberal idea. It's a very dangerous idea. It's, it helps them win as well. That's why they go after you so aggressively when, when you fight back, because they would prefer that you do nothing and, and let them take over your country without resistance. Or even Ronald Reagan, old peace through strength Reagan. Like, conservatives are all about it when it comes to trying to finally get the Middle East to embrace democracy. But in their own country, they're like, eh, I could take it or leave it. Like, why does evil stop being evil in politics? Evil is the most evil in politics because that's how it propagates and sustains itself. Like, why do you take pride in D-Day? Why, why do you become enlivened thinking about establishing a beachhead in France while your friends are getting gored by machine guns? But in America, these people are trying to put your kids on cross-sex hormones, and you think that's just a part of liberty? That's how the founders wanted it? No, if, if James Madison, if you told him that your interpretation of his constitution was that, he would punch you in the mouth and probably execute you while you're on the ground with a flintlock pistol that he stole off the body of a British officer during the war to establish the greatest nation in the history of the world, which you've allowed to go to hell because, what, you refuse to fight back? Because you think that human nature is universally inclined towards the don't tread on me mentality? You think that we are governed by the divine Gadsden flag? We're not. Founders knew that too. If modern conservatives were in pre-revolutionary America, they would have let the British walk all over them. They would have said, well, if we attack the British, how are we any better than them? That is the mentality of a weak man. There's nothing noble about being a weak man. We were born out of a revolution against people who were exploiting us and working against our interests. It was the most powerful empire in the world, and your ancestors kicked their asses back to the other side of the Atlantic, and now you're here, you're willing to kneel to these people because you think that it might make them stand for the national anthem and vote your guys into office? Get a grip, man. Never kneel. Never submit to these people. You're not just playing to be left alone anymore because that didn't work. You're playing to win and you are playing for keeps. Break the conditioning. Transcend your carnal desires. Accept your mission and become the American that you want to be and that we need you to be and that your children and grandchildren desperately need you to be. And I don't know if this has any significance, but I thought I'd bring it up. I'm inclined to think that it does. Basically, I used to read a lot of stories when I was younger. My mom and I would read all sorts of stuff together. One of my favorite ones, probably top three, was The Lorax by Dr. Seuss. I don't know why I liked it so much. I think it like the criticism of it I found very intriguing like you know you never see this one slur character his name is sort of mysterious you only see he's got like these green arms and uh setting is always very dark and ominous but anyways for whatever reason I decided to read that story again after about like 12 years the other day uh, and there was a quote in it that I thought I would share with you because when I read it I actually I got chills and the quote is unless someone like you cares a whole lot then nothing is going to get better it's not and I think that quote is incredibly applicable to what we've been talking about recently because obviously we grow up we hear things like well everyone's special we can all change the world but the reality of the situation is that that isn't true most people are basically sheep and that's okay that's to be expected but because of that we need good people to make sure that evil isn't allowed to to conquer our country. That's why I love that quote, because it doesn't say anyone. It specifically says, unless someone like you cares, nothing's going to get better. And that's completely true. Unless someone like you cares, someone who's smart, someone who understands what's going on, you're a good person, without your support, nothing's going to get better. That's another Von Klauswitz quote. He said, there are very few men, and they're the exception, who are able to think and feel beyond the present moment. It's totally true. You look around you, everyone is focused on stimuli. They're focused on Instagram or Netflix, whether they're going to get Chipotle or Chick-fil-A for dinner. Because people like that, they used to find a purpose in their lives through survival and providing for their families. But now we are so saturated in wealth. People are just trying to numb the void of existence with products and stimulation. And a lot of that stuff is actually on the list. But I got to hang out with a couple dozen of you guys last weekend when we filmed the Father's Day video. Some kings drove out to help with that. I've met you guys at conventions, at speaking events. The point is that if I didn't actually 
believe that we were capable of doing something, I would just go collect five-figure checks from baby boomers to show up to events and say, well, I'm young, but I'm also conservative. Something, 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 freedom. Something, 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 Second Amendment. Something, something, Abraham Lincoln. Something, Ronald Reagan. If I ever do that, put me out of my misery. And please aim for the head, because I could not stand my mother looking at the face of her son who sold out in an open casket. And it's funny when we talk about it, but there's so much money that's just burned going towards things like that. It is such a disappointment. I know people who could bring America to its knees with $100 million, which isn't even that much money compared to what's being blown by the Republican leadership. That's really the most exciting part about all this, in my opinion. I've met some incomprehensibly brilliant people, and the way I think about it now is basically, well, even if we lose, it's going to be a hell of a fight. And we need you there for it, big guy, so we'll finally get to the list. So the first one, anyone who's familiar with the channel is going to be able to predict it, uh, and that is that you have to stop watching porn. You have got to cut it out, my guy. I did a whole video about it back in November, but for now, I'll just say this. A disciplined mind is an effective mind. If you don't have discipline, then anything that you do is going to be less than what it could be because you'll always be susceptible to the the distractions of your carnal instincts. And if you're watching porn on a regular basis, I promise you that you're addicted to it. And if you don't believe me, try to quit for three weeks. Prove me wrong. And the leftists in the media, they promote porn consumption as completely harmless and even something that's healthy because it reduces stress. But that's just because they're sexually degenerate and their worldview functions better when everyone is like they are. Distracted, weak, hedonistic beings. Also, the negative effects of it, including the chemical imbalance in your brain, it's not going to lower your stress levels in the long run. You don't want to be like that. You want to be collected and calculated and totally in control of yourself. You want to be the best man that you can be, and that means you're going to have to stop watching porn. Aristotle said, I count him braver who overcomes his desires than him who conquers his enemies. For the hardest victory is over self. That's totally correct. How do you expect to conquer your enemies if you can't even conquer yourself? Let's go. Speed round. Fast money. Porn lowers your motivation. It makes you depressed. It makes your brain cloudy. You aren't as focused. It lowers your testosterone. It causes sexual dysfunction. You won't be able to be satisfied by normal things. You're going to require weirder things to get off. You're going to have stronger cravings than meth addicts. It damages your brain. You lose gray matter. It damages your memory. It's associated with ADHD and bipolar. Uh, you fry your dopamine receptors. It's, it's not good. I've got books on the website that go deeper into it, uh, and I'll probably have to make another video about it because I didn't get into the data as much as I'd have, I'd have liked to in the first video, uh, but I'm begging you, like with tears in my eyes, stop watching porn. It is making you weak. The men who built this country weren't frying their brains and hormones by spending hours inside every week touching themselves while watching people have sex on a screen. Like, get a grip, man. And tell your friends to get a grip, too, because chances are they're addicted to it as well. So moving along, you got to reduce your screen time. Uh, you need to spend less time on your phone, less time watching TV. A good wake-up call for most of you would be checking your daily screen time in your phone settings and then trying to remember what those like seven hours consisted of because a lot of times you won't even know. And that's because firstly, you weren't doing anything actually important. You were just mindlessly cycling between the same few apps and you're probably addicted to your phone and you're probably not even having fun while you're using it. Like there have been times where I've been on my phone because I'm effectively addicted to Twitter and I've wanted to go do something else. Like I wanted to go read or play drums or go run but I literally could not get off my phone. Like I would keep checking things, I'd keep refreshing things. And so what I've had to do is like physically shake myself out of it and be like, no, we're done with that. We're gonna go do things that we actually wanna do now. And uh, I was just talking with my mom about this a few days ago because when I was growing up, I was always doing something. If I were playing a video game, it's because I went downstairs precisely to play that game or I'd have Legos or Playmobil or Imagine Next. Uh, I used to try and sell my Beanie Babies to my neighbors for like a dollar. I'd read those bone graphic novels. What other Zoomer nostalgia can I think of? I don't know, but like there were always gears turning and I was in control of what I was doing. But now these really young kids or even teenagers, at least the ones I know, they don't do anything. Like they basically spend their entire days in front of screens and it's not even because they want to, it's because they don't know what else to do. They're like addicted to it. It's become the default setting. They're like zombies. And you can call me a boomer and, oh, these kids in their phones, but that's probably just a code because it's not like I grew up in the 70s. I grew up in the 2000s. I'm 20 years old, and already the childhood experiences of a kid born in 2007 are completely different than mine. And the effects of this are increased anxiety, stress, loneliness, depression, exacerbation of attention deficit disorders. It literally rots your attention span. It also diminishes your capacity to concentrate or be creative. It disturbs your sleep, uh, and it makes you more self-absorbed. Like, why do you think kids can't even read books anymore? It's not that they're uninterested. It's that they literally cannot sit still and like focus on words on pages. They need constant stimuli, changing colors, new information, app refresh. Like it's not good. It's keeping you from reaching your potential. And we'll talk more about some things that you can do to better yourself as an alternative to this. But the point is that there's nothing wrong with watching TV or being on your phone if that's how you relax, but your existence should not revolve around pastimes or relaxation. If you get your life in order, you know what you have to get done, you schedule time for relaxation afterwards, you're going to enjoy it a lot more. You're not going to feel worthless. You'll feel as though you've earned it because you will have. 
translate this into our current situation, basically only when we have the country back on the right track can we binge watch The Office for the fourth time. We don't have time for that right now. So the next one, these are all related to consumption, but you should cut out or at the very least minimize your consumption of junk food, marijuana, nicotine, and alcohol. Firstly, because of the same reason that we've already gone over, which is that we want to rid ourselves of our addictions so as to make ourselves as strong and competent as possible. And also because these particular addictions in themselves make you weaker and less competent. Junk food makes you depressed and it makes you fat and fat on your body converts your testosterone into estrogen. Sugar in itself can damage your cognitive functioning, including your memory, attention span, and ability to process information. That's not good. Then there's marijuana, which kills your motivation and dopamine levels. Nicotine is extremely addictive. Basically, every young person I know is hooked on it. How harmful it is depends on how you're getting it into your system. Uh, and then there's alcohol, which literally converts your testosterone into estrogen. These are all bad for you. Some with more harmful effects than others. But the point is that all the time you spend doing this stuff, all the money you spend on it, that's all spent not bettering yourself and in most cases doing harm to yourself. And that will result in you failing to meet your potential. Stop consuming things to get a dopamine hit. Go out there and accomplish something instead. Like we need you in the field. Remember, a disciplined mind is an effective mind. Next one, uh, the general obsession with consumerism, finding meaning in your life through products. Stop doing that. Stop worrying about brands. Stop wasting money on things you don't need. You shouldn't be spending money uh, and saving what's left. You should be saving money and then spending what's left. All the money you spend on crap you don't need is money that you could have invested in yourself or even invested into your country by supporting candidates, organizations, independent media, etc. You don't need to go out to eat so much. Like the time you spend getting the food or waiting for the food to get to you is about how long it takes to make food for yourself, especially if you're doing this like every night stop buying lottery tickets stop seeing and buying like I see I buy break the cycle transcend your role as the eternal consumer it all goes back to discipline like you have to put your money towards things that actually matter and things that will help you uh, last one arguably most important stop simping I'm an authority on simping because I did a very thorough analysis of it that got like 150,000 views. So let me remind everyone that what defines simping is the lack of reciprocity. Being nice to a girl who's being nice to you isn't simping. Like you should do that. But showering these girls with compliments and attention constantly who are obviously not interested in you, telling yourself that one day she's going to realize what a nice guy I am and how I've always been there for her. No, she's not. That's a cope. What's the saying? If you treat her like a celebrity, she's going to treat you like a fan. That is totally true. Go watch the simp video for a more thorough explanation. But the bottom line is that wasting your time going after these girls is stupid, not only because it doesn't work, but because it's just pathetic. Frankly, you're like begging for sex. You're a total bitch. Women don't like nice guys. Women like epic guys. And the way to become an epic guy, chapter nine on becoming the gamer, is to structure yourself towards your mission and your purpose. That's your priority. Your priority is not flesh. You're not an animal. You are a man, and you're capable of greater things than that. That. And if you're really concerned about women, make yourself a better man and the decades of feminist conditioning will melt away like ice. And if you go into it thinking like, oh, I'm going to do this so girls like me, you're not going to succeed because your mentality is disingenuous. You have to go into it knowing that your priority is to become a better man, a man who is not governed by his primitive desires. We're not doing this whole like, oh, bro, I just have to get laid thing. That was like a Gen X 80s, 90s thing. Gen Z is totally different. It's like, bro, I just have to save Western civilization. Like that's the mentality. The task at hand will be the greatest and most significant task in the history of the country. We're not even guaranteed victory if we optimize ourselves, but we have to give it everything we have. We have to be focused. We have to be sharp. We have to be completely in control, which is why these are all important steps. But now, um, the things you can do to make yourself a stronger man, and these are not like secrets, by the way. These are pretty common sense. But the first thing is that you should be reading books and playing instruments. There are tons of cognitive benefits to both of these. I'm not going to take an hour to cover those, but you should be learning things. You should be educating yourself. So read books. And if you want to know which books to read, you can get access to my book recommendations on the website. I had eight new books every month from my personal stack of books. It's only $4 a month. That's nothing. And I remember when I was younger, I used to always want to know what my favorite commentators were reading. And so that's why I share all of this on the website. And these aren't just like books on the issues, if you will. Uh, these are from my library. We've got some political philosophy. We've got some military theory. We've got some literature. Basically, we've got everything that I've decided that I should know for whatever reason. So that's up there and it's updated often. Reading good books basically does to you what stupid people think going to college does to them. It's pretty epic. So uh, next thing, you got to you gotta lift weights to literally become a stronger man. Be active. It increases your testosterone, makes you more confident. There's really no reason not to. Also, learn a martial art. I would say wrestling is a good place to start. I've seen guys that are like 5'8", 140 with just a few years of wrestling training just dominate guys who are like 6'4", and 220 because they know what to do with their weight. 
And most people just don't have a clue. And as a man, there's something different about being in shape, but also, and arguably more importantly, because it'll get you in shape as well, having that like martial arts training and knowing that you can walk into almost any room and be able to just level any guy in there. That's confidence. Maybe it sounds a bit rough, but this is the nature of men. We are competitive and we are aggressive. These leftist men, they're very emotional. And because of that, they can get aggressive sometimes. But the difference is that we are calculated and we are strong. So like, let them do that. And if you have to break their teeth in self-defense, you know, oh well. Um, also, a lot of the reason guys are hesitant to get involved in like weight training or martial arts is they're afraid that people are gonna be rude to them or they're gonna like suck at it, things like that. But the reality is that 99% of the people you'll meet doing things like that are just like very excited that you're interested in what they're, in what they're doing. And if you ask them for advice or for help with something, they're almost definitely going to respond positively because think about it, like when you ask someone for help uh, or for advice, you're implicitly complimenting them because you're suggesting that they're competent enough to give you the advice that you need. And everyone likes to feel competent. So yeah, there's usually nothing but nice guys involved with stuff like that. You know, of course, you're going to get a couple dicks, but... If you're looking for guys, there's always going to be dicks, you know, that, so that's important. But um, also important is that you establish a structured routine in your life. At the very least, you should be going to sleep and waking up at the same time every day because when you construct uh, this order in your life, it will be easier for you to accomplish what you need to do. You won't be as stressed out about things and you'll be more productive and you'll, you'll be able to delegate time uh, for, for working and time for relaxation. And then when you get to relax, it's going to be a lot better. So that's important. Discipline and structure basically go hand in hand. This one doesn't really fit the theme, but I still think it's important. Um, you have to take pride in your appearance. And you have to dress well. You have to put some thought into how you dress. There's nothing masculine about looking bad. A lot of times guys think, well, girls are worried about how they look and they're girls. So I won't worry about that because because I'm a man and I'm epic and like that's nonsense you know you should put some effort into your appearance and you don't actually have to break the bank to do that it really doesn't have anything to do with the brands of the clothing it's really more about how the clothing actually looks and I don't know anything about fashion uh, I actually have one of those clothing subscription services because I like to look nice but I don't care about the process of that but I realized I didn't actually have any variety in my wardrobe so I was like okay I'll just pay some metrosexual guy to figure it out for me so that's what I did uh, but I will share my one creation the magnum opus of my fashion career in the summer you go to Kohl's get about 10 plain white t-shirts from Urban Pipeline. They'll run you about seven bucks if you time it correctly. You wear those under a patterned cotton button down and you can experiment with the buttons based on the shirt, but never button all of them. That's how you get all the 18 year old Catholic girls with present fathers. This look right here. I did it once, saw my reflection in the window of a car and I was like, yeah, yeah, this every day. That's the summertime aesthetic. And if you really want to push it, you can wear a minimalist watch as well. But if you do that, you're going to have to prepare for carpal tunnel because you'll be shaking so many father's hands because their daughters will just keep introducing you. It won't stop. If you're not ready for that, then then don't listen to me. But uh, anyways, last one, you should actively try to make yourself less agreeable. Say no when you want to say no. Stand up for yourself. Refuse to apologize unless absolutely necessary. Refuse to lower your voice. Be more than willing to assert yourself when necessary. Any power that the left have or the left has is rooted in emotion. You need to assert your power through strength uh, and they'll submit and they'll lose. You know, I made a resolution for myself a couple years ago, which was that I was never going to lower my voice when discussing anything controversial in a public setting. Like not that I was going to be loud about it, but I wasn't going to change the volume at which I was already speaking because I was afraid of what other people would think. You know, a large part of taking back the culture is normalizing our ideas within the cultural dialogue. And we can't do that if we're afraid to talk about them. And we can't be effective in general as a cohesive unit if we as individuals are weak. So cut out the bad habits, cut the addictions. I believe in you. We need you. Keep your head up, king. Might not get better, but at the very least, we will become stronger. Hey guys, if you like this video, give it a thumbs up. Leave it a comment with your thoughts. Subscribe to the channel. Share the video with a friend. Uh, and turn on notifications for posts so you see the future videos when they post. Big brain. All right, thank you so much for watching and may God bless America.